On today's episode of the John Campy Show podcast, the original Deadpool director, Tim Miller, he's going to be directing a new sci-fi comic film called Alien Legion. Also, speaking of Deadpool, Ryan Gosling's new film, Fall Guy, which looks really good, it's moving away from its original release date and it's going to take over Deadpool 3's original release date in May. Madam Web has dropped its first trailer. And Wait, what? Supergirl is now coming out and it's got a writer... And they hired a writer who has never written anything. It's me. It's that and a whole bunch more of the John Cave Show podcast starts right now. It's me. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn move related show on the planet Earth, the John Cave Show podcast. Coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you in part by our friends, at Mint Mobile. I am, of course, your host, uh, John Campy, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around so we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but hopefully giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or a little bit different than ours. Uh, joining us today, or right over here, we got Ray Ora. What's up, baby? <laughs> Jonathan Voiko's here. Sorry, I'm uh, writing out the script for Supergirl right now. <laughs> Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. Dude, you're not going to believe, I mean, maybe you saw this trailer. I can't believe it. Where did that come from? They made a Madam Web movie. I can't and believe it. Most importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here, making this show part of your day. And here's how today's show is going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those predetermined topics that I listed off. Then in the last part of the show, we're going to go ahead and take your comments, questions, and topics. Now, we already asked our beloved YouTube channel members here on the channel to send in some topics a little bit earlier. But if you're watching live, you can use the Super Chat feature in the live chat. And as long as your topic or question is appropriate to be addressed on our show, we will address those a little bit later. All right, guys, with that down, let's dive right into it here, shall we? And we're going to talk about this. Tim Miller, the director of the first Deadpool movie, uh, also went on to uh, direct a Terminator film that I think most people like to forget. Uh, but he did such a great job on that Deadpool movie. Tim Miller, it has been announced in The Hollywood Reporter that he is going to be directing for Warner Brothers a brand new Alien Legion movie that they are hoping to turn into a big franchise. This comes to us from The Hollywood Reporter, who write the following. Warner Brothers is building its own galaxy that is far, far away. The studio has picked up the rights to Alien Legion, a star-spanning sci-fi comic initially published by Marvel Comics uh, with the aim of building a homegrown space opera for the franchise. Tim Miller, who directed the original Deadpool as well as Terminator Dark Fate, is attached to direct. Now, if you don't know much about it, it is described as the French Foreign Legion in space. The story is focused on an intergalactic peacekeeping force that took in all manner of species without asking too many questions about their past or intentions. Operating within an unwieldy government system known Known as the Galactic Union that is starting to be that is straining to be a democratic melting pot. Prejudice and bad intentions abound and struggle with well-intentioned idealists. Uh, so that's what's coming out here. So look, we've all said for a long time in this business that franchises, that's the gold mine, right? That's the goose that lays the golden egg. Potentially it can also go very badly. Just ask Universal with their monster universe that they try to launch. But franchises, what everybody's trying to start. They all want to get franchises going. Uh, you even got, you know, Lionsgate right now, which is trying to reinvent a franchise with Hunger Games. That one comes out this week. I'm actually really interested to see that movie. I'm, I'm curious to see how good that's going to be. And so they're going to go to a comic that probably not a lot of people have read and know much about called Alien Legion. And listen, I'll tell you what, the premise of it sounds good. I like the idea of Tim Miller being on board there. Again, I loved what he did with the first Deadpool. Anyway, Rob... You heard about this. I mean, Tim Miller being involved, trying to launch a not so well-known comic franchise. I know this isn't going to be part of the MCU or anything like that. What do you think about this? First of all, I love this comic. I have every issue. It was uh, Epic Comics. Uh, Marvel had sort of its its highbrow line that was more elevated, call it elevated, than their superhero lines. And Baxter Paper back in the early 80s, mid-80s. This comic kicks ass, and it, it it is astonishing to me that it has taken this long for somebody to adapt this property. 
I am, I, what I don't understand, John, I mean, I understand that Don Murphy and Susan Monfort, who did like Natural Born Killers, are producing. How did Marvel let this go to Warner Brothers? I mean, now mm. I want to know. I mean, this was one of my favorite comics in the mid 80s. Anybody who I think remembers it loves this comic just because the diversity of crazy alien, the alien designs, the artwork in this comic, it was hardcore. I mean, it, it had kind of a, imagine if the space Marines and aliens were more alien and they didn't get their asses kicked. <laughs> you know, um, it, it was, uh, this, this was a hoorah in space. It was so good. The characters are so good. I love this comic and I hope that Marvel uh, finally we'll get an alien legion omnibus because i'd love to see all of the issues collected in hardcover well here's an interesting thing holly reporter gave a little bit of background on it that i wasn't aware of they, they said this they said legion was co-created by carl potts a former editor and writer at marvel and was introduced as a part of the publisher's creator owned imprint epic comics in 1983 yep. it became the line's longest running title even outliving the imprint when it was moved to other publishers oh. in the 21st century alan zelentitz and frank Sirocco are the other co-creators. So it, it may not have been something that Marvel even had any control yeah, over. Yeah, I didn't realize. You're it, you're right. That means it's creator owned and when it's creator owned they just published it. It was which is great. I mean, that's why they were able to get rested away from Warner Brothers. I just hope that maybe Warner or, or Marvel will go back and republish the comics because the comics are quite good. And, and they they described it as the 30 dozen meets aliens. It's yes. like a one of the websites. So it's kind of like are they trying to get their own Guardians of the Galaxy there? At oh Warner, yeah, at yeah. Warner Brothers. Yeah, they're they're trying to get their own franchise going for like this is never. There's no way they're intending this to be a one shot movie. They want they hopefully want to make this successful and turn it into a big franchise. By the way, kudos to the graphic because that is the cover of issue one. <laughs> there you go. All right, with that down, guys, let's move and talk about this, shall we? Ryan Gosling has his new movie coming out with Emily Blunt called The Fall Guy. Uh, based on an old Lee Majors television series, which I don't remember. I remember I watched a few issues when I was a kid or a few episodes when I was a kid. At any rate, I didn't even know they were making this movie until CinemaCon back in April. And Ryan Gosling, who had already been out on stage promoting the Barbie movie, came out again, this time with Emily Blunt. It's like, oh, what else are they promoting? They talked about the fall guy and they showed us the first preview for it. And I'm like... This, this looks pretty good. And then they dropped the first trailer uh, last week or two weeks ago with the Bon Jovi song playing behind it and Aaron Taylor Johnson being in there. And you know what? It just looked like a big bag of fun. I'm really, really excited about this. Now, it was supposed to come out in March, from what we understand, but not anymore. It's been pushed back, but maybe for a good reason. This comes to us from the folks over at Deadline who wrote the following. Universal Pictures is pushing back the release of The Fall Guy, starring Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt. The action comedy film was originally set to premiere on March 1st and will now, now drop on May 3rd. The Fall Guy revolves around Gosling's Colt Seavers, a battle-scarred stuntman who, having left the business a year earlier to focus on both his physical and mental health, is drafted back into service when the star of a mega-budget studio movie, that's Aaron Taylor Johnson, being directed by his ex, Jody Moreau, Emily Blunt, goes missing dun 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 now uh, uh interesting note that may date that it moved on to if that date sounds familiar because that was the date that deadpool 3 was going to come out on of course recently they announced that deadpool 3 due to the actor strike they bumped it a couple of months to july 26th i believe is now when deadpool 3 is coming out so that leaves that left a big open spot in this prime may is now kind of the beginning of the summer movie season this big prime juicy spot sitting there and uh they took a look at that and said you know what let's move this thing there i am very excited for this film and it's not just because ryan gosling is a good canadian kid but it just really looks sharp i'm excited about seeing it, it looks funny anyway rob you heard about this do you like the first of all what do you think about their decision to push it back a couple of months to get that May date, and then where's your anticipation level like for the film? Well, like you, I mean, you know, I heard vague rumors that they were going to make a Fall Guy movie, but when we saw it at CinemaCon, I'm like, okay. Because it looks like, you know, it, it looks like it has enough, it looks that they're not taking it that seriously. Because the Fall Guy was a great TV show, but to remake it, it, and when I saw this, I'm like, okay, I'm in. The trailer that was recently released looks fantastic, but I think it's an obvious move 
to move it to May. This is, from what we've seen, to me, a big summer popcorn movie. Bump it in to the uh, slot where it's going to make the most money. It just, John, it just looks, the trailer puts a smile on your face. It looks fun. I want to munch some popcorn and see this movie. Because Emily Blunt and Ryan Gosling, their chemistry in this film looks great. I can't wait to see it. I also love the idea of, and maybe this is something that the original show did too, just from the little bits, the presentation they showed us at uh, CinemaCon, because then they brought out a whole bunch of stuntmen. Remember that? They yeah, yeah they did. Random stunts. Which was cool. Which is really good. So the presentation they showed us and a little bit more in the trailer, I really hope that they give us a good dose. I mean, the movie isn't about this, but give us a good dose about how this ridiculous movie magic happens behind the scenes. Like, show some of these crazy things that these individuals and these people yeah. have to do. And you put on top of that this great kind of almost murder mystery sort of idea. Like, suddenly they find Aaron Taylor Johnson dead in a bathtub. Now what do you do? It just got, has all those. I like the little, the DNA, the feel of the comedy barbs they've got in it. Yeah. Uh, it looks like the action sequences themselves are going to be get great. Ryan Gosling's on a massive role right now with the number one film of the year in Barbie. And... Uh, Man, this is great. And yeah, I'm a little bit bummed out that we've got to wait a couple more months right. for it, but you are 100% right. This feels like a summer popcorn movie. If that date opens up, I think you jump on it, and I think this is a good 100%. Movie. Looks like he's doing his best Marty McFly here. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Actually, it does look a little bit like him, by but the way. even this scene, if this kind of, I mean, this kind of, I'm sure the stunt, because isn't it directed by one of the John Wick directors? Uh is Leech. It, oh, Dave. Uh, uh, I don't think it's Leech. Don, Don, yeah, like, like yeah. isn't that a Bullet Train director? Yep. So you can tell, even from the way it's shot, that they're maximizing the idea of the stunt. So I think you're going to yeah. get what you want. And it looks like there's a lot of practical stuff in here, which is fun. And I, I, I'm there for it, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about looks this. Looks great. All right, guys, listen. We still have to talk about uh, that Madam Web trailer actually Wait, dropped today. <laughs> Uh, also, Supergirl, they just hired a writer it's that me. has never <laughs> written anything. Um, what the hell's going on? Anyway, <laughs> that and a few things more. But before we get to that, we're going to take a quick second here, guys, and thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, our friends at HelloFresh and Quip. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Quip. Guys, you know that good health starts with good habits, and Quip makes it easy by delivering all the oral care essentials that you need to care for your mouth. For example, their incredible electric toothbrush. Guys, I've been using electric toothbrushes for years and this is easily the best one I've ever owned. Time sonic vibrations with 30 second pulses to guide a dentist recommended two minute clean. A lightweight and sleek design for adults and kids with no wires or bulky charger to weigh you down. Reusable handles in a range of sleek metal hues as well as bright plastic colors sure to make a pop on your bathroom counter. Skip the bath batteries and snap into healthy habits with the new rechargeable electric toothbrush. All the features of the original Quip plus one magnetic charge powers up to three months of brushing. In addition to brush heads, Quip also delivers fresh floss, toothpaste, mouthwash, and gum refills every three months from just $7. So if you go to getquip.com slash campia right now, you'll get 20% off any electric toothbrush, mint and gum dispenser, or water flosser. That's your 20% off any electric toothbrush, mint and gum dispenser, water flosser at getquip.com slash campia that's g-e-t-q-u-i-p dot com slash campia quip the good habits company Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. Guys, the holidays are right around the corner and HelloFresh can help take the stress out of dinner by delivering everything you need to cook up tasty meals right to your door, saving you tons of time. We all know the holidays can be hectic and that's that's where HelloFresh's 15-minute meals come in. These quick fixes help you get a wholesome meal on the table in less time than it takes to get delivery. I've told you guys many times before that Ann and I, being working professionals, often would struggle when it comes to dinner time, having time to put something that tastes good and is healthy for us in front of us. Well, HelloFresh, with their great delivery, pre-portioned ingredients, easy to follow instructions, has made dinner time a fun time. So go to HelloFresh.com campiafree and use the code 
code Campia free for breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash Campia free with the code Campia free. And thank you to our friends at HelloFresh and Quip for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this. A long time ago, they announced that they were doing a Madam Web movie, to which most of us said, like Jaimon Hansu in Guardians of the Galaxy, who? <laughs> or even why? Why are you doing a Madam Web? I mean, it's it's literally a third or fourth level side character here and there in the comics and whatnot, but a lot of said who. Now, I admit that when we started hearing whispers about a year ago, that it was going to kind of have a bit of a Terminator theme to it uh, about time travel, somebody trying to stop what somebody's going to become and all that kind of stuff. And they, they released some of the first production pictures. I kind of went, you know what, that, that could be interesting. That could be interesting. So finally today with the movie coming out, in, I believe in February, they dropped the first trailer. I have a couple of thoughts about it. First in general, I liked it. I, don't get me wrong. It's not making me jump up and down and go, oh my God, this is the greatest. Story. <laughs> I in general liked it because it kind of did confirm those reports that we had heard last year that there was going to kind of have a Terminator theme to it and all that kind of stuff. And it, it definitely had that kind of a feel. And this whole, the whole idea of the motif is not a brand new thing. We've seen it done before, but this motif of somebody, somebody being able to go back and try something again uh, and then embracing, you know, destiny. I love that you got Adam Scott in there because I love him. I really do like Dakota Johnson. I, I think she's quite a good actress, even though she hasn't always been in the best stuff. So I like her a lot. So overall, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was good. But there's something that concerns me. And it's it's only a momentary thing. But it concerns me like if you as a studio, and I get it, they probably got a third-party marketing company to make the trailer. I get that. But you got to view it and kind of approve it. And if you as a studio couldn't tell that he was with my mother when she was in the Amazon studying spiders. You didn't buy that? I, By the way, I just said it with more passion and drama than it is in the trailer. I'm like, if you... You are a studio and you're watching that trailer and you don't recognize that. Wow, that sounded bad. And that sounded like a class project of making a short film with the new class video camera. Well, that, I mean, he was hunting lions and he got bit by a giant lion. Yeah. Now he is craven. <laughs> but I mean, like the 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 woodenness, <laughs> the woodenness of the sound of the dialogue. And not in all of it. Some of it sounded perfectly fine. But but there's a good chunk of this trailer that the dialogue and the narration sounded just pure wooden to me. And I'm like, if that's what you're putting forward as your best representation to sell people on the movie, it makes me a little bit nervous. <laughs> and maybe I'm being nervous for nothing. Maybe it'll be perfectly fine once it plays out in the context of the movie. I understand that and I accept that. In general, I liked what I saw. Um, has it made me super more excited for the movie? No, but it kind of reaffirmed that interest that I had understanding it sounding like what the themes are going to be. Anyway, Rob, you had a chance finally to watch the trailer. Um, and we didn't talk about this beforehand, but no. what did what did you think about the trailer? Pros and cons? Well, you know, I mean, obviously I will retire the joke about there's a Madam Web movie. What? It's there's a Madam Web? <laughs> No more. Uh, um, that, that joke is, it, uh, if there's such a thing as a, a played out joke, that is the, that is the one played out joke. 18 months the show. in the making. But I think, that, yes, I was actually intrigued by this because, you know, when we heard what the movie was actually about, uh, I was like, I'm intrigued. That sounds interesting. The time travel element. They're bringing in different elements of the Madam Web character from the comics, which I think is intriguing. Like you, I'm wondering why do this movie? I still don't think they did a, I, I thought this trailer was confusing from the standpoint of, is this a Spider-Man movie? It's called Madam Web, but how is this going to be? It's really weird that that Sony is making these Craven, Venom, now Madam Web, these Spider-Verse movies, but they don't do it. I mean, it looks like Spider-Man's in this movie, at least the Iron Spider. I mean, the people that know the comics know that that's not the case. But other than that, John, I'm intrigued. I, I really like you, like Dakota Johnson a great deal since I saw her uh, 
in, in the social network when she was in the one scene with Justin Timberlake. I find her very appealing both when she appears on talk shows and uh, on the movie screen. And I thought this movie, the trailer at least, looked good in the sense that it made me want, it did what a trailer did. For a movie I thought did not exist and couldn't remember it existed, now I'll not forget it. Can I'm I, interested. Can I, I want to see it. Can I just say, though, that, and it sounds it sounds really nitpicky, and it is, but, and I don't know if this is the right term. I'm going to try to sound smart here, but it's almost a Pavlovian response for me. There's a color palette that Sony mm. uses in this Spider-Verse, right? Yeah. Of whether it be Craven, whether it be Morbius. Um, it wasn't so much in Venom, and I think that's why maybe Venom kind of worked more for me. But And now with Madam Web, that when I see this color palette, I just get this like response of I don't think I'm gonna like this. Mm, this looks really cheesy to me. This looks cheesy to me. I I know what you mean, and I think you're not wrong, because you know what? It's more of a is it? Would you consider it more of a comic booky color yeah, palette yeah, as it, opposed it, to taking place in the real world? Yeah, exactly. It's almost a little too saturated. Yes, and and it feels like oh, is this made for TV or something? So like, okay, we were just kind of like. Um, Ray and I were were comparing that with uh, Captain Marvel because at the beginning of Captain Marvel trailer, she says, like, I've been getting these visions or whatever, <laughs> and we we're kind of making fun of the similarities. But I was like, but look, even in Captain Marvel, this looks cinematic, and the color palette looks more believable, and this, it, it just has this weird fake, gets this weird response from me. More like TV. Mm-hmm. Yep. So what, if you had to give a list of things that were like pros or cons of it, like what would you say are some pros, things that worked for you in the trailer, some things that didn't? Well, I think pro, the idea of what's happening to her specifically is interesting. The idea that, you know, once again, you've got this gaggle of, of characters that are all intertwined. We all live in the same apartment building. I'm like, okay, that seemed, that could be intriguing within the story itself. Or at least two of the characters do. Well, yeah, at least two of the characters. But in the trailer, I'm like, it's like you were saying it seems a little convoluted and a little like i i'm intrigued by her story getting unstuck in time like uh, happy death day and somebody have to re repeat that storyline repeating and having fate and understanding you can go that's interesting to me but there was definitely a lot going on in this trailer that i thought con was confusing overall I still don't know. I want to see it, but I'm like, what is this movie about? Well, again, it is just the first trailer, right? right? Like, you know me. I want trailers to give us an idea about what is this movie, but I'm okay if the first trailer is not the one to do it. Yeah, no, like, it's, give us it's a little true. bit of a taste. I and... mean, I mean, it, it 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 looks like they spend money on it. It looks really intriguing to me, but again, I don't know. I'm not convinced it's going to be a good movie. Yeah, well, I mean, here's one of the interesting things. A lot of people think forget that Adam Scott of course, from Parks and Rec fame and now is starring in, uh, uh, not Sedition, what's... Uh, um, the, Apple you know, the Apple Plus show. Severance. Severance, Severance right. <laughs> Sedition. Severance. <laughs> um, he's playing Ben Parker, is his character. Yeah. Is Ben Parker. And uh, Emma Roberts is playing Mary Parker. So, like, that's where, when we heard about the Terminator angle, and then we found out who those, the characters that they were playing, we... we uh, we're left to wonder, is this about somebody trying to stop the birth of Spider-Man? Or, like again, going very much to the whole Terminator motif. So, I don't know. We'll see. Thematically, the trailer works for me. Yeah. Execution, I have some concerns with how wooden some of the dialogue sounded. So, is this going to be the next Morbius? Or is this going to be the next Venom? I, I don't know. So, hopefully, it's going to be more like the next Venom. But I'm, you know what? I'm excited to see it. Uh, as of right now, I'm I'm looking forward to it. So we'll see how we feel after we see trailers two and trailers three, if we still feel that way. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? It was with great fanfare and joy among the people when it was announced that James Gunn and Peter Safran were taking over DC as the new co-CEOs and executive chairs of the DC now getting, for the first time ever, its own actual studio its own actual dedicated studio something that warner brothers never let the dc films have before and now here they were they've got it and we've got superman legacy coming very excited about that and one of the films that james gunn let us know was that that they were going to be doing is supergirl now just for context here i am a major james gunn fanboy he has and he's earned it 
I have become a fanboy because I have loved his approach to filmmaking. I love the attitude he brings to filmmaking. And so far, for the most part, I still would have liked to have seen Henry Cavill around, but for the most part, I, I've loved what we've seen so far as far as, far as his and Peter's decision-making process about how they're going to proceed with this new DCEU. We're not really going to know if it's good or bad until we get to Superman Legacy in 2025. But Rob, I got to tell you, today, today, if James were to walk into the room, it was one of those days where I'd say, hey, James, um, what you doing? Because they've announced that they've hired a writer for the new Supergirl movie. Big, tentpole, superhero, big budget film, major motion picture. And they hired a writer who has never written an episode of television and never written a feature film. No experience. They wrote one short film. So have I. Ask me how much that's worth. Uh, at any rate, this comes to us from Deadline, who are quoting a James Gunn putting out a social media message talking about Anna Noguera, who is now on and writing Supergirl. And it sounds like the, she's at minimum got a couple of drafts done. Says this, a hearty public welcome to Anna Noguera, to the DC Studios family. Anna is an amazing writer. Really? Show me something. Anyway, is an amazing writer whose screenplay adaptation of Woman of Tomorrow is above and beyond anything I hoped it would be. We're excited to be moving forward on this unique take on Supergirl in this beautiful star-spanning tale. And uh, again, that comes to us from James Gunn. So upon hearing this, I was like, whoa, wow, we got a writer. That's funny. I don't recognize that name. It turns out there's a reason I didn't recognize the name. As I went over to her IMDb, she is primarily been an actress some people might recognize her she did a short stint with four or five episodes on vampire diaries uh as an actress didn't write any of the episodes because when i went to look for her writing credits i didn't see any hmm. and then i had to look more closely well the reason i missed it is because there's one credit and it's not for writing on any significant television series it's not for writing on any feature film big studio low budget or indie or otherwise this individual's written a short film one short film now i you guys know i always get concerned when i hear about whether it's a director or writer who has never done anything taking on a big project as their first thing um, even our X-Men buddy standing in line at, uh, Toys R Us, Ray. Uh, uh, it, uh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, why am I freezing on his name? The guy who does Invasion. Um, the guy who did Invasion. Anyway, he, yeah, yeah. they, they announced that he was directing X-Men, the Dark, the Dark Phoenix X-Men movie. Simon Kimberg. Simon, Simon Kimberg, Kimberg, right? Kimberg. We love Simon Kimberg. I love Simon Kimberg. I think, I, I think he's wonderful. He's done a lot of great stuff. Some not, some not so great stuff. Everybody has bad days at the office. But, and even though I love Simon, when they announced that he's going to be directing that X-Men movie, he has never directed shit before. And I went, oh no. <laughs> like, I, Simon, maybe the first thing you direct should be something a little smaller. Maybe it should be something that... A smaller budget, not as high expectations. And it t now he didn't make the worst film in the world. I think there was some upside to his movie. I do, but overall it failed. The film failed. And I always get a little bit nervous when this happens. And now listen, I'm not saying I don't trust James Gunn. James Gunn says that she's written an awesome script. I have to just take his word for it because I got nothing to back that up with. Not a television episode, not a single film, nothing. And I trust Gunn, I do, but you have to be blind not to be at least a little concerned about this. Like, really? Is this the right platform for somebody to write their first real script? Is, is that the platform? Is this, is this the platform for the first thing they're going to have produced is going to be a big, important, probably large budget comic book superhero film? It, while you are currently trying to rehabilitate and rebuild the reputation of DC films. In, in five minutes, I can pull out a list of 20 female writers who have won or been nominated for writing Academy Awards. Couldn't get any of them. I, I, I'm just, 
And again, I'm not saying that's going to be bad. It might be great. It might be great. You can heave up a half court shot. Maybe it'll go in. Maybe it will. But I don't know why James and Peter don't put themselves in a better position to increase their odds of success by going out and getting somebody who has some experience, who has some work that they've done that has been produced and showed that it can work. Again, this might turn out to be the best screenplay of all time. I'm not saying that it won't. I'd just be lying to you as a big James Gunn fan and as somebody who very much believes in the future of DC, I would be lying to you if I wasn't honest and say, this particular move makes me nervous. It does. I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that. Anyway, Rob, uh, you heard about this move. First of all, it's based on a pretty cool sound and story. Yeah. But uh, what do you think about what we're hearing? Well, here's the thing. I think in the case of this writer, it wouldn't surprise me if she's written a number of full, full-length full feature films that have not or have yet to yeah, get just, made. But no, nothing that's ever been picked up. Or nothing, but, but so they understand that, and maybe she's done script doctor work. They understand that she's done amazing work, probably even for Warner Brothers. We just haven't seen it yet. So they hired her because they knew what storyline they wanted to adapt. And... Uh, you know, in this case, I they have a lot riding on this, and I think James Gunn did not make this decision lightly. So, for this kind of a writer, I think it's because she's a she's a writer we're going to hear a lot about. She now has this very high profile project. I mean, I don't think anyone has had more pressure on them in the history of cinema than James Gunn does to deliver on not just Superman totally agree. legacy and then yep. the Supergirl movie. And I, I, I mean, for his entire legacy in entertainment, if he screws this up. No one's going to remember you made Guardians of the Galaxy movies. <laughs> so I, I, and knowing James a little bit, I, like you, trust. I trust in Gunn. I really do. And I think people should, I, I look, I, I could be wrong about this. I think what, what we know that Superman Legacy is going into production, we have a release date on it, and now this is the, it seems to be this is the next movie that's coming from them that is moving forward because now we're hearing about it. He's tweeting about it. I would assume that this one-two punch is going to be something special, especially in our superhero fatigued world. So I'm I'm all in on gun. If it's a poker metaphor, I'm putting all my all my John. I'm putting all of my chips in on the the gun super franchises here. Oh, I listen. I I am 100 on the James Gunn train. I really am. I, I am also to to pursue the metaphor, pushing in all my chips. But I'm going to get a little bit nervous. When I push them all in, but then turn over my hand and see I got seven deuce. I, I'm going to be, you know, just, it's, it's not that I don't believe in James. I completely believe in James. But, you know, you pointed out there's so much pressure on him and Peter, right? Because they have a task in front of them that I don't know anybody in the history of Hollywood has faced. To have a complete, well-known, popular, and beloved franchise that has so completely failed and now you got to try to re-kickstart it and rebuild, get back. See, it's one thing to try to win over an audience. It's another thing to win over an audience that has already turned against you. And so much of the movie going audience has turned against the DC films. We saw it with nobody going out to see Black Adam, nobody going out to see The Flash, nobody going out to see Blue Beetle. Despite the fact that I think all three of those films, pretty good. Black Adam was was good. I liked it. I really liked Flash, and I really liked Blue Beetle. And yeah. ain't nobody went to go see them. So it's hard enough to win over an audience. It's five times harder to win over an audience that has turned already turned against you. And in that context. James Gunn and Peter Safran are now facing this daunting task of rebuilding a DCU. And I, I kind of wish to quote Sean Connery in (laughs) the untouchables. I kind of feel like they're bringing a knife to a gunfight. I I, I just feel like they should be going in with bigger weapons. But again, James has read the script. I have not. That's what gives me some. Maybe it's great. Yeah, that's why I don't have as much pause on this, because it's not like he said, we hired this person. She's going to do great. He's saying. I've read it. I've read it, and this it's is fantastic. Amazing. Yeah, he's saying it's great already. Yeah. And I do think she got the job because they'd 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 read stuff she'd written before that hasn't been published yet made. Or, or picked and I, up look, or looked to keep that to keep that poker metaphor going, John. Let's hope it's not a flop. Well, I'll just I'll just hope it's he's not bluffing. <laughs> it's not a bluff. I hope he's back in a set, man. Royal flush. <laughs> Whatever I, I need to see. I think he knows what he's got. And I think, you know, people are are they're they're thinking that because James Gunn has only made like I watched Suicide Squad again the other day. 
That movie's great. It's so good. That movie's great. Now, it's a different sensibility, but a great storyteller can work in every genre. And I think James Gunn, he's already done the Guardians of the Galaxy Suicide Squad thing. I think he's going to lean in to the classic nature of this character and is going to give us something very special. Well, it also kind of broadens now what we're looking at as far as this new DC universe, right? Because, okay, we know we've got man a, a superman legacy coming okay we know we've got the batman brave and the bold but that's not coming anytime soon uh because they just talked recently that andy muschietti after the writer strike i think the priorities were different prior to all the strikes but with all the strikes and things getting moved around andy muschietti is now turning his attention to a couple of other projects first and batman brave and the bold is going to have to just wait so either they change directors or we're gonna have to wait on batman brave and the bold uh, there's James Mangold's Swamp Thing that is supposed to be happening at some point somewhere. Uh, now we've got the Supergirl thing that's in motion. We The animated, um, what's the animated one called? Something, creature Commandos. Creature, creature Commandos, Commandos yeah. thank you. That's the I was almost like Creature Legion, but we're just talking about uh, right. the, the other one. Um, so it's we're starting to get a picture of what's coming and when. They still haven't announced a director for the Supergirl film. That's going to be the next key thing. Probably the most important thing is who they're going to get to direct it. Catherine and Bigelow. So, oh, God. Wouldn't that be dope? Catherine Bigelow directed it? You get Catherine Bigelow directing a Supergirl movie? Yeah. <laughs> Any hesitations or minor doubts I have right now will be gone. The uh, last film I saw of hers was Detroit. Has yeah. she done one since Detroit? I don't think so. Detroit was brilliant. I, I mean, I can't watch it again because it was so heavy, but it was so good. Please bring Catherine Bigelow back, everybody. Uh, I mean, oh my God. If James Gunn announced tomorrow that Catherine Bigelow is directing Supergirl, I would lose my shit. I know. Be, uh, Me too. All right, guys. What do you think about this? Like, I, listen, you know me. I am all in on James Gunn's DC, but I, I have to admit, I. I call it like I see it. This call makes me nervous. I always get nervous. You know this about me. I always get nervous when they announce because almost every single time they bring in somebody doing their first thing, it rarely works out well. So in James, we trust. I'm just a little bit nervous. All right, guys, listen. With that down, we are now going to spend the rest of our afternoon taking questions from you guys. What thoughts, theories, opinions, or questions do you guys have? We're going to get to those in just a second. But before we get to those, we're going to take just a moment here and thank the main sponsor of the John Campus Show YouTube channel, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video. Mint Mobile. Signing your life away to a big wireless provider is kind of like being trapped on a roller coaster from hell. Sure, it looks like fun at first. They probably even threw in a free phone, but now you can't get off. Month after month of insane bills and unexpected thrills, like overages and surprise fees. If that sounds like your current big wireless plan, it's time to get off the ride with Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just 15 bucks a month. You guys know before, I came to Mint Mobile, I was paying triple what I am paying now on the standard big wireless plan, and I will never go back. All plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped right to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com dot com slash campia cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia and thank you to our friends at mint mobile for sponsoring today's episode of the john campia show podcast all right guys listen we've got a bonus issue to talk about uh this news has just broke after we started today's show and it's huge but it goes along with some stuff we've been hearing. According to Deadline, this came out again like 15 minutes after we started today's show. Destin Daniel Cretton, the, the guy who directed, did such a marvelous job directing Shang-Chi and who was then brought on to direct the next Avengers film, Avengers Kang Dynasty. According to Deadline, Destin Daniel Cretton departs as director on Avengers, the Kang Dynasty, remains aboard Wonder Man, Shang-Chi 2, and more in the MCU. Now, listen, I am reading this. You are hearing this as I'm reading this for the first time, guys. So bear with me to get into this. 
exclusive to Deadline. Deadline hears that filmmaker Dustin Daniel Cretton has decided to step away as director of Marvel Studios' Avengers Kang Dynasty to focus on his other Marvel projects. This is an amicable exit, I understand, as Cretton remains fully in the Marvel Studios family. In fact, Cretton is in talks with Marvel Studios about directing future movies. Note that Avengers Kang Dynasty is far... Uh, is far on the theatrical release schedule, dated to kick off summer of May 1st, 2026. So still like almost three years away. Uh, the movie will proceed Avengers Secret Wars on May 7th, 2027, which will wrap up the Marvel Cinematic Universe Phase 6 plans. Okay, what they have not said in here so far, and why this is big, but why I am not surprised to hear this, we have been talking the last couple of days, including yesterday, that all indications right now, we, of course, did a story yesterday where the writer of that new book, MCU, the uh, the Marvel Cinematic Empire or something like that, whatever the, I've got the book, I just can't remember the full title of it, but the author of that book came out and said that, yeah, Jeff Loveness, the writer of Kang Dynasty, has been removed from it, and that she said, and she has the best sources inside of Marvel Studios right now. She said she has been told that's because they are moving away from the Kang storyline. And we talked about this yesterday because that made sense. When you look at the end of Loki season two, how does it end? It ends with the TVA. Well, first of all, no need for Kang anymore. They said the TVA is now repurposed instead of pruning uh, timelines. They're now just exclusively dedicated to going out and hunting down Kang variants. And right at the end, we see Morbius with, hey, yeah, we got this one holding up the file of one of the Kang variants. And it sounded like, yeah, they're moving away, which made us bring up the question, well, what on earth is then going to happen with Avengers Kang Dynasty? To hear now that the director is now off the film, listen, obviously this isn't what they're saying word for word. To me, this is a confirmation. Avengers 5 is not going to be Kang Dynasty. I mean, they clearly love Destin. He's great. You don't remove him unless, yeah, the movie you were going to direct, it's not going to be that movie anymore. It's like, cool. I'll go focus on what I should have been focusing on, which is Shang-Chi 2. But anyway, we'll go into that. That's another issue for another thing. You know, they absolutely love him over there. This is clearly not an indication that they don't believe him in him. Uh, Rob, I'm hearing this. Again, this is speculation. This is pure speculation. But... I'm putting one and one and one together, and I'm seeing three. I'm seeing that this is yet another kind of affirmation that Marvel is indeed moving away from Kang Dynasty, and maybe they're just wrapped up now with the whole Kang storyline. Uh, first of all, we just heard this. What's your first reaction here to hearing that Dustin is now off this movie? Do you think, hey, listen, comic book movies sometimes lose their directors, and it's nothing more than that, which could absolutely be the case or do you think there's something deeper here like yeah this is not going to be kang dynasty anymore how do you see it if i were to be asked and you just did i would say this there is no more kang dynasty movie it's gone i'll tell you what's going to happen john and people have been talking about this online i didn't come up with this myself but it seems like what marvel character would be more interesting to people now they made kang they killed kang anyway they made kang a couple of times by the way couple of times, of times. <laughs> uh, kang they neutered him before this let me ask you this who do you want to see as the next big bad in the marvel cinematic universe stilt man uh, honestly me yeah personally yeah apocalypse okay but he's but, a mutant we yep. can't, okay, okay. Yeah, probably, it, so, so let's probably let's gonna say, be doom that's exactly right mm. dr f and doom <laughs> and you know what if you're moving into secret wars you can go right from Doctor Doom into yep. Secret Wars. What is going to happen is they're going to retool the Fantastic Four, which is going to come out before the new Avengers movie because they need the Fantastic Four, and they are going to reposition what they should have done in the first place and make Doctor Doom the big bad. And you know what? They're going to call this Avengers Rise of Doom or something, which is way better than Kang Dynasty because I'll tell you something. Do you know what killed Kang Dynasty for me? That last post credit scene in Quantumania. That was so goofy. With the football stadium full uh, the of Kang's football stadium. <laughs> I'm like, no. It was so I, enough. I was like, I'm done. You guys have ruined the idea of Kang. I'm telling you, Dr. Doom is the man. He always was the man. They're finally going to do Doom right. And Doom can move you right into Secret Wars. And you can come right off the heels of your Fantastic Four movie. And it's teed I up. mean. Even in Secret Wars, at least the first one, right? Kang was still a like underling to Doom. Totally. 
totally. So I mean, you could bring Kang back if you want, I guess. But I mean, maybe that's what maybe Doom brings some Kang variant to help him. But it's going to be doom, doom, doomy, 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 doom. <laughs> Here's what I said yesterday. I want to know what you think about this. We were talking about this with the report coming out that saying they were moving away from, from Kang. And one of the things that I said was that forget Jonathan Major's legal problems. I don't think the decision to move away from Kang honestly has anything to do with Jonathan Major. I don't either. He has been great playing. The, well, I don't he know has. Where, whether he's playing He Who Remains, whether he's playing Victor Timely, whether he's playing Kang. He has done great yeah. every single time he's been in there. But one of the things that I said yesterday was that we have now had three major things with Kang in it. Loki season one. Loki season two and a complete dedicated movie in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. And through three major projects, forget the comic books, people who watch the MCU have no idea why they should be afraid of this guy. No, no idea what his even powers are. No concept about why is he any kind of a threat? The dude lost a fight to Scott Lang. He lost a fight to Ant-Man. They've had three films and two years to get the audience on board with this is the dude, like Kang is the guy, right? I, I said that, you go back to the first Avengers movie, from the moment that his little mouth puppet said to challenge them is to court death, and that moment that in the post-credit scene, Thanos just turns around and smiles, they accomplished more in that one second of on-screen stuff than they've been able to accomplish with Kang. And again, Jonathan Majors playing Kang has been brilliant. But the audience has just not gotten on board. He does not feel like the universal big bad right now. And they need to, I think they need to change directions. You know, one of our viewers, we just had it pop up in uh, on the screen. Uh, the name, like Avengers Dooms, D-O-O-M apostrophe S, Dooms Day. Right. Why not? And by the way, I'm open to I'm open to it being somebody else. It doesn't have to be Doom. They like listen. You don't start developing Fantastic Four and all that kind of stuff without already having your game plan for Doctor Doom. So they clearly have a plan for yeah. Doctor Doom. So I'm okay if heading in the next two Avengers films, if they go in some other direction other than Doctor Doom. Doctor Doom seems like the obvious answer like that's that's the one that just is like gift wrapped right there if you want to go that way everybody's calling for it everybody wants it you could uh could i go mean that you way. could do anything you could have doom be in contact with the celestials you could do all kinds of things which would be more interesting than what they've done with Kang. richard's arts don't pay attention to history you are doomed to repeat it <laughs> doomed oh to repeat it the richard <laughs> on the john campion show by the way let me go back to what we're what i said a little bit earlier though we have seen many occasions over the years of a comic book movie with a director and the director leaves. Sometimes for bad reasons, sometimes for totally benign reasons. And maybe that's this. Maybe it's just Destiny was just like, you know what? I, I'm looking at the schedule. I thought I could do all these different projects, but I really just want to focus on getting Shang-Chi because it's been too long since we've had Shang-Chi, so I need to go back and focus on that. That might be it, and maybe this has nothing to do with the Kang Dynasty. I'm just saying for right now, to me, it seems clear. Like, yeah, they're moving on. They're moving on past it, and a lot of us thought that maybe they would wait to see what would happen with the Jonathan Majors court situation, but I think they just realized, you know what? It, it's not about Jonathan Majors. Jonathan Majors has been great, but it's yeah. not about him. It's that... Marvel has failed over two years to get us really to get the average audience really invested in Kang and understand why he's such a threat. And you're right, the post credit scene in Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantumania probably didn't help things all that much uh, with the football stadium and everything. Soccer hooligans, <laughs> the soccer hooligan Kangs, uh, that probably didn't help either. But I, I, I think it's just a matter of days now until we hear the official announcement because. I don't, you weren't there, but Kevin Feige held an event when they were doing the announcements for MCU phase three. But you texted me. That's, I did. I was there in spirit. <laughs> I was there at the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood, and they were getting ready to announce 
what we had, they had already said was coming, Captain America, Serpent Society. Oh, right, yeah. And then on stage, they brought up Captain America, Serpent Society. He goes, but we got a little surprise for you. And it crosses out, and then a new title, Captain America, Civil War, comes on. I think we are days, maybe three, maybe 200, but I think we are days away from that announces that Kang Avengers Kang dynasty is now Avengers, you know, the butt tickler or what, whoever the villain is going to be. Oh no. Someone's going to do some fan art for that. (laughs) So, um, I, I think that (laughs) (laughs) none of us do. I don't know if you guys hear, but every once in a while, I don't know why, but Siri on my watch just suddenly says something out of nowhere. Anyway, uh, guys, what do you think? Uh, about this do you think that hey this is just another uh director move the director wants to focus on the other mcu films or are you like me saying hey look it's not a coincidence that we're hearing these reports that they want to move on from this the writer for it's now gone and now the director it's like hey the movie we're gonna make we're not making that movie anymore uh is moved on i i personally see this as a loose loosely termed confirmation uh that the Kang storyline is done, but maybe it's not. We'll find out. Whatever you guys think, let us know. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to your question, shall we? We'll start off over there in the Super Chats. What do we got up here first, Jonathan? All right. Well, give me one second here. I think we're going to have to start with tips here first because my Super chat, something's going on with the window. So let me try to fix that while okay. we answer some uh, questions from our members here. All right, let's do that. So Yulatan writes, I'm not familiar with Madam Web in the comics, but do you think that her ability of seeing the future will be similar to what we just saw in Loki? I kind of thought that too. Seems similar. Maybe. Like, see, I, I don't know if it's so much time travel as it is precog. I, I, I wonder if she's more of a precog or whether it is a happy death day slash groundhog day slash what Loki just did slash what 50 other films have done where she can move in a time loop or yeah. she's she's got precognition. So it's going to be interesting to see which direction they go with that. All right. What's next? Okay, uh, we got Dr. Stinky who writes, Hey, John and crew, I'm going to see Hunger Games, but I've not seen any of the other ones. Should I watch the other ones? If so, I guess it's time to sit down and watch five films. Also, one of the main songs in the movie is made by my favorite modern artist, Olivia Rodrigo. Can't wait to see how they use the song in the movie. Anyway, love y'all. Bring on the filthy. Having not seen Songbirds and Snakes yet, I can't tell you whether you need to see the other ones first. However, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess you don't have to because this is a prequel to those movies. Uh, Now, if you did have an understanding, I mean, just go into the movies understanding this. The young blonde kid, the main blonde lead dude in this movie goes on to become the big vile villain of the Hunger Games series, President Snow. So I think that's really the only thing you need to know because, again, this is the prequel. So I think you'll be safe. Um, I got to admit, Rob, like when they showed us the preview stuff at CinemaCon back in April, I had very little interest in another Hunger Games movie. Me too. But I've been one over. I'm going to go see it on Thursday afternoon. I'm, I, I got to admit, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing Dude, it. Dude, I've heard nothing but great things. The people that have seen it say it's terrific. And it is Francis Lawrence. And, you know, aside from, like, with Water for Elephants, which he directed, which right. I thought was beautifully done, but what the script, maybe not. He's never disappointed. I mean, yeah, he had to deal with the hunger. He he did Catching Fire and Mockingbird or Mockingjay uh, 1 and 2. But those stories were, were, he did a great job directing them. And I loved Constantine. Mm. You know, I mean, he's a great visual stylist. I think this movie looks cool. I'm actually more excited about it than I thought I would be. Not as excited as my friend Dieter Bastian is, but I, I'm excited. All right, what's next? All right, so we can try this with supers. I'm going to bring it up in this uh, window here um, and read it like this for now. But we got, let me just move this over here a little bit. Oh. Well, now it's just being silly. Um, go down here. So this first one's from AL. And he writes, I've seen comparisons to Madam Web to Superman, and I think he means uh, Lois. Um, what what comparisons are there to make with Superman and Lois? I don't understand that. I, I mean, You're probably thinking of something specifically that's that I'm not thinking of, so mm-hmm. I, I don't know what we're talking about there. All right, yeah. what's next? Well, AL's back and says... Um, Got to go to this one here. Um, 
uh campia or campiac the anniversary is upon us the greatest movie masterpieces of all time the cat in the hat oh my gosh turns 20 next week eat your heart out scorsese wait a minute the the michael myers cat in the hat is 20 years old dude we're all gonna die soon Jeez, rob come on old old how can that be that movie's 20 i'm that blows me away holy crap <laughs> blows me away holy crap Ugh. all right <laughs> good canadian kid though yeah my mind yeah absolutely all right what's next all right we've got uh, Ber uh berserk writes uh maybe it's it's how the trailer was cut but i'm not a fan of how they were delivering their lines in madam web trailer yeah something just fell off the the one thing that i always warn people about trailers and i uh, and i warn myself too is that remember we are seeing and hearing things out of context right so like to me it's he was with my mother when she was in the amazon studying spiders okay that whatever maybe once because many times there have been things in trailers i didn't like and then when i saw them in context in the movie it's like oh well that actually works i i think a lot of the dialogue sounded very wooden but again that's out of context chopped up rearranged by some marketing company so maybe it'll play better uh, I just want to go back on that first question that we didn't understand. The chat is saying it said Spider-Man Lotus, not uh, Superman and Lois. Oh, Spider-Man so Spider Lotus. Yeah. I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not really familiar. I, I don't know that either. That's probably storyline that came out mm. after I stopped reading Spider-Man. So, all right, what's next? All right. That makes more sense, though. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Stinky writes, Madam Web looks okay at best for a film that does not exist. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, but for real, the, what, what the F was that, that trailer? It looks like a uh, fan film. Yikes, Sony. I disagree. I, 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 like I, fan I, film, I, I thought it looked okay. Yeah. And I didn't think it looked great. I thought it looked okay. Um, so, well, again, my one real problem with it is that a lot of the not all of it but a lot of the dialogue delivered seem kind of wooden to me and that's concerning all right what's next all right we got uh enrique uh, mejia writes hi john um went to jonas brothers concert in seattle on friday and had a blast been a fan since the early 2000s getting to hear their older songs was awesome gotta tell you uh my wife as i think it was an anniversary present to her i agreed i said whatever you want she goes you got to come with me to a jonas brothers concert i'm like Dude, the things we do for love. All right, <laughs> fine. Let's go. They were awesome. They put on an awesome show. Um, my wife has gone to see six shows, six Jonas Brothers concerts in the last year and a half. But I get it. I get why. They really, honestly, truly put on a fantastic, energetic show. And uh, I really quite enjoyed it. You're not worried that one of them is now single again? So, I, you know, I, your wife. well, did you see the video of them of, of Joe Jonas I, I, I did. giving Ann eyes? That's what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, listen, I got enough to worry about my life. Now I got to worry about fucking Joe Jonas. So <laughs> there's there's that. All right, what's next? All right, Marcus Penner with a almost fourteen dollar super chat says, Thanks. "Hey John, how would you feel about a connected MCU uh, that isn't building up to something and focuses on its own films with occasional cameos?" I'm almost tired of how uh, this. Uh, ties in with the larger MCU. Don't care. All I care about is make good movies. That's all I care about mm -hmm. at this point, seriously. See, a lot of people say, well, the reason that the MCU hasn't been, it's because they haven't connected this. It, no, no, the reason the MCU has been faltering is because they're not making high quality movies, period. Look, as long as you're making high quality movies, if it's all interconnected tightly to a, to a big core story, great if they're loosely connected like they exist in the same universe, but they're not really interconnected and they just kind of cross over here once in a while, Great. As long as you're making great movies, that's all I care about. Everything else to me is fluff. All right. What's next? All right. We've got uh, David Cushmore who writes, are we going to get another alien movie? I would like to see alien versus Superman or even alien versus Batman. Alien versus Superman would be pretty short. I thought they are. They're we actually, are. I got news for you. It's already done. Yeah. It's, Betty Alvarez. Yes. Yeah, and it's coming out. So there's that. Um, alien versus Superman would be one of the most boring movies ever. Like a thousand aliens rushing <laughs> Superman. High beams. Yeah. They're all dead. Yeah. There we go. By the way, Ridley Scott has seen the new Alien movie. And he says he likes singing it. singing its praises. He's a, yeah. Yep. He said he really loved Betty it. Betty Alvarez is a great, you know, he did the Evil Dead remake. Yep. He did Don't Breathe. I love him. He's I think great, he's, man. So I can't wait to see good. that Alien movie. All right. What's next? All right. Ron H. writes, uh, where's the news about Henry Cavill in uh, Warhammer? Don't know much about the franchise, but it looks cool. 
Well, I mean, Henry Cavill's got a number of things on his plate right now. Like, first of all, there he's going to be actively in promotion of the new uh, Argyle thing, which, by the way, I think looks... It looks great! It looks so good. <laughs> I am totally charmed by it. Um, they're ramping things up for this new Highlander thing he's doing. That's probably taking priority. So I think we're still a number of years away before we find out anything more about his Warhammer project. I'm sure it'll happen, but I, I think it's going to have to take a backseat for a while. All right, what's next? David Cushmore writes, uh, will there be a third Venom movie? They're already in production. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yep, it just it just paused production because of the actor strike, but they're right back to it. So yeah, it's it's already being shot. So it was it was being shot before the strikes happened. So yes, it's on its way. All right, what's next? All right, <laughs> excuse me. We got Shamrock Vibes who writes, wasn't Emerald Fennel at uh, one time attached to WB's project? Um, my memory could be wrong. After Saltburn and Promising Woman, she'd be great for Supergirl. I don't know who what we're talking about. Emerald Fennel. She she directed Saltburn that's coming out. But she, but like was the what was that stuff about that she was directed attached to a the, WB a super, one project. of the James Gunn verse movies. Really, I, I don't. Know. I, don't I don't recall don't. hearing that. I'm, I'm that just because I don't recall hearing it doesn't mean that that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. I just personally don't recall hearing that. So I mean, maybe you heard her name because that Jacob Elordi dude who was in Saltburn was one of the runner in the running to be the new Superman. Yeah. So maybe that was it, or maybe you're right. Maybe her name was mentioned, but maybe, maybe there was a report about that, but it was never true. A lot of different possibilities. All right. What's next? Adam K writes thoughts on WB letting coyote versus Acme be shopped. Yeah. Why not? I mean, their, their reason for pulling it wasn't because they thought it was utterly terrible. They just said, thought they couldn't, they just didn't believe the movie would make enough money to even make mm -hmm. up for the cost in marketing the film and putting it in theaters. So that being the case, why not make money off it? Give it to, if there's some other streamer that's willing to carry it, yeah, like sell them the, the rights to, to, uh, to be the exhibitor for it. Why not? Make some cash on it. And it doesn't cost them. See, here's the brilliant part about doing that. You now let it get released, you get money, and you don't have to put up $1 promoting it. <laughs> so it's, it's actually the best of both worlds for them. So I'm glad it's going to happen. All right, what's next? Aiden Foley. I want to hear Jonathan's Vincent D'Onofrio voice. <laughs> I think he's referring to Inkpin. You heard Vanessa. Still one of my favorite lines in Daredevil. <laughs> All right, what's next? The Richards Arts writes, I'm down for superhero Final Destination. Actually, this, you know what? You're not wrong. There was a little Final Destination mm -hmm. feel in that Madam Web trailer. You're, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. There was a little bit of a feel of that in there. I, I would be cool if that, there was a little bit of that in the movie all right what's next uh and then the richards art follows up in gun we trust dude has vision let's see listen i just because you're a fan of something or someone and believe in that something or someone does not mean you turn off your brain and never have doubts when you see certain things happening there, I, I defy you to find anybody online who has been more supportive of James Gunn taking over DC and what he's going to bring to C DC than I have been. You're going to have a very hard time. But that doesn't mean I'm just a blind fanboy. When I see something that gets me a little concerned, I mention it. I am a little concerned that they're getting somebody who's never had any, never been hired to write anything on a TV show, has never written anything that's ever been produced as a feature. It, it, it concerns me. It is a concerning thing. That doesn't mean James Gunn isn't right, and it doesn't mean James Gunn doesn't actually have a fantastic script in front of him. I'm just saying I would probably feel a little bit better if it was somebody who had a little bit of a track record. Yeah. And I, and I don't think that's crazy of me to feel that way. Anyway. All right. What's next? All right. We got um, Ho Jose Mays writes, uh, Daniel Cretton leaves King Dynasty still in um, board with Wonder Woman or on board with Wonder Woman and Shang-Chi too. Yeah, we were just talking Probably about Probably meant that. Wonder Man. Wonder Man. Wonder Man, yeah. Wonder Woman would be a completely different You know thing. what's doing this? I keep, because I'm looking at the Superman logo here, and I keep going Superman, yeah. Superwoman, you yeah. know, <laughs> Wonder Woman. I'm going DC. All right. What's next? All right. Um so Marcus Penner writes, should DC Studios do some kind of marketing campaign in the general to the general movie going audience to make them understand we're in a new age of DC? What should that look like? It should look the a well-made trailer. You don't have to do a marketing campaign about the new cinematic universe. A well-made trailer will tell will be self-evident. 
it will speak for itself. For example, when Tom Holland became the new Spider-Man, you know, Sony and Marvel didn't have to first put out an ad campaign. Hey, everybody, we loved Andrew Garfield, but we've got a brand new Spider-Man in Tom Holland. No, no. As soon as they started putting out the trailers for Captain America Civil War, it became evident that that's what they were doing. If they do it right, it'll work. You know what else, too, John? I think, you know, next month an Aquaman movie comes out. Mm. And I think after that, we're not going to hear anything about DC superheroes until the first trailer for James Gunn's Superman drops. They're going to let time go by and people are going to forget there even was a DC universe because yeah. people are fickle. And when they drop that trailer, it's got to be one of the most banger trailers of all time. I sure damn well hope so. Mm. It, it better be. It better be. There has never been a film that it's that was this important that it be good because this is literally their entire cinematic thing rests on this. So it and even be beyond that, we got great trailers for Superman Returns and great trailers for Man of Steel when they first came out. So oh, yeah? it's got to be. It's got to surpass that. It's got to prove to people. All right. What's next? We got Kyle Schneider who says, John, thoughts on Invincible 2 so far? The multiverse storyline is straight from the comics, but do you think they should have changed it up? Listen, I, I have not watched the second episode yet. I, I watched the first episode. I haven't watched the following episodes yet. I, I'm gonna, we were going to watch it last night, but then Ann and I realized we hadn't seen the Adam Eve special yet, so we watched that instead. I will say this, though. And, and remember, episode, I haven't watched past episode one. I liked episode one. I enjoyed it very much. Maybe look for, but the one thing was, didn't Superman and Lois do this exact storyline? Like in Superman and Lois, you have Steel, who's from an alternate future where Superman is bad and killing everybody. And he feels like, I got to kill this Superman because he's Superman. He's going to go bad just like the other Superman. And the ending of episode one of season two of Invincible, it was basically the same thing. This guy came from a, from an alternate future where Invincible joined his father, Omni-Man, and took over the world and murdered and committed genocide and all that kind of stuff. So now he's like, I have a hate on for this thing. He's like, this is the exact same storyline from Superman and Lois. But again, I haven't seen episodes two or three yet, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. We got breaking news right now. Oh, no. Oh, dear. Saturday morning fan just pointed this out. Godzilla minus one, Rotten Tomato score, 100%, baby. With how many reviews? Six. <laughs> Let's get to 20. Let's get to 20, then we'll talk. But I have heard great things about Godzilla minus Ooh, one so far. All right, on. what's next? Okay. We got I Am Kang, so this is going to be awkward. Uh, Kevin Wright, Loki producer, says that Michael Waldron is working on both upcoming Avengers films. So could it be that they're changing directors? Um, here's the thing. The reason we never covered that as a story is that I read that and it came across to me as a guy who doesn't really know. Like, remember, this is not, this is somebody who's working on the Loki series. And it, it almost came across to me like it was outdated information he was saying. Again, I'm not saying that's the case. He might be right. 100% he could be right. But I'm going to need to hear some confirmation about that beforehand. But we do know they're changing writers and they definitely are changing directors. So we'll see how that all kind of turns out. All right, what's next? Raf Todorov writes, hey there, can't be a crew from Denmark. Uh, so somehow the Madam Web movie looks like it's going to be worse than Morbius. I disagree. 100% disagree. And, and by the way, there are only uh, two things that I hate. One, those who are <laughs> tolerant of other people's cultures. And two, the Dutch. Uh, I anyway. saw that one coming. <laughs> All right. Some people won't get that reference. Know, but yeah, right but now the he's Dutch, like the Dutch is the Netherlands and Oh, you're right. They're not Denmark. Denmark is the Danes. Yeah, the, the Danes. Danes. We like the Danes, but the Dutch. You're right. By the way, Copenhagen is I've been there. Uh, it's Denmark is a beautiful place. I don't know who got that beautiful reference, people. but hopefully you got the, you guys got that reference. All right, All right. What's next? I mean writes, uh if if Kang is really over, Ant-Man Quantumania becomes even more relevant now. Doom is the perfect choice, uh, and they have time to build him up. I would look as somebody Relevant. who does not like Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantumania. We've yeah, established dude. that, but if Kang is actually over, I would argue it makes Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantumania more relevant yeah, to the ending because look. Yeah, Ant Man actually is the one who stopped him. Right, Ant Man is the one. Ultimately, it makes what Ant Man did in that movie instead of just one step of an inevitability. 
Because ult- really, if Kang was just going to come in and sweep everything in the universe, stuff like that, that kind of renders Ant-Man and the Wasp, the whole story there, irrelevant. But if he's the one who actually stopped it from getting from, from progressing and stopping that one worst version of him, it might actually make it more relevant. Dude, you're totally right. And And if you couple that with Loki and the ending of Loki, that's a really kind of a nice yeah one two punch in terms of re well, t- teeing up the universe for going in a different direction yep because ultimately think about it if he who remains was right right that no matter what loki does all of he who remains his variants are all coming and there you can't stop them period then it, that almost renders loki irrelevant it, it almost renders like okay so it was inevitable and we're going to now we're moving on to the Kang dynasty and everything that Loki did in season two didn't really stop anything. But if you move away from the Kang storyline, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania becomes more important and it really makes what Loki does at the end of Loki season two that much more important. Well, like you've been pointing out, look at it. It also makes Loki's entire journey throughout the entire Marvel Cinematic mm-hmm. Universe so relevant. Yep. And more meaningful. And more meaningful. Yep. You're right. 100%. All right. What's next? Zequinox, Zequinox writes, Marvel Lampoon's Avengers Left Variant Vacation. Uh, I, I, I don't know about this. Doom's Castle, kids. <laughs> All right, what's next? All right, so we can move over, back over to um, our, uh, our fine uh, members here. Uh, the Brandon Salad writes, Hey, crew, hope all is well. Your opinion on what makes a great director? On what makes a great director? Yeah. Being a great storyteller. That's it. You got to be able to know how to tell a story and lay out a story in a certain way that that the audience receives it well. And, and and the other thing I'll add to this, I've always believed that the number one most important job of the director is bringing out the appropriate and best performance out of their actors. But uh, really, it's just be a great storyteller. I know, Rob, I mean, as a director, uh, how would you answer that? I, I think you're absolutely right, but also understanding how to employ the tools of cinema Mm -hmm. to tell that story because like a great writer understands not only just how to tell a story but uses language as the tool to convey that story and the language of cinema needs to be understood a great storyteller also has to understand how to use that language and i think for instance you know a, a great director like you said knows how to work with actors does great casting but but knows where to put a camera you know, Martin Scorsese is, and Steven Spielberg, that man knows cinema, man. He yeah. knows how to use that camera, move the camera, block. Oh, a virtuoso. Mm-hmm. All right, what's next? Okay, hey, you know what? Real quick, I just wanted to show this because we've talked about uh, good movie posters and we're talking about the Fall Guy today and I, I saw the Fall Guy poster. This is oh, an I awesome example like of yeah. a movie poster. Look, I'll zoom out a little bit. It looks like he's rescuing her, but it's his ex-wife. He is actually arguing with her. You know what I mean? It tells the story, and it's not a human pyramid. And it's clearly a stunt that's being done. I've always said I love posters that kind of capture the spirit of a movie in one frame, and that kind of does it yeah. right there. Also, the, Jimmy Kimmel is going to be the host of the 2024 Oscars. That just broke right now. Oh, oh really? Oh, we'll talk about that okay. tomorrow. All that's right. good. I, I think he'll be fine at it. I, I prefer it when actors host the Oscars, but whatever. He'll be fine. All right, All right what's back next? to our members. CJ Rebirth writes... Um, Wow, look at this. Uh, Madam Web trailer was fine for me. I'm interested in the movie. Love Dakota Johnson. Mm -hmm. And as someone who didn't read the comics, I want to see how she'll end up like Madam Web. I know in the 90s Spider-Man cartoon. I don't know if we're going there. I've never seen the 90s Spider-Man cartoon because I don't really care about that stuff all that much because that person because the person in that cartoon is just like in the comic Ray would be not, upset <laughs> she's like she's she's outside of time and you know what i mean like i don't know if that's yeah what's your, is it the web of fate or what what is she there's a name for the mm-hmm. web and that's uh, why all the spiders yeah. are connected to it yeah. yeah all right what's next all right we've got uh amin writes according to jeff uh snyder um caitlin J- uh dever is Dever-er. in talks to Dever is in play in talks to play Abby in The Last of Us 2. Uh, I won't believe it just yet, but she's a terrific actress and would make a great Abby, in my opinion. Probably has to bulk up a bit, though. Apparently, she is, was actually in the running to play Ellie in The Last of Us uh, movie, or you mean series. They wanted to do, uh, or a movie that they wanted to do, and has already worked with Naughty Dog in the past. Thoughts on this potential casting? I first took notice of Caitlin Dever in Booksmart. Uh, she's great. She's so good. That, in that. movie's great. Yeah. No, it's 
It's and it's one of the great, I'd say a top ten great example of a first time director. Yeah. Um I I love that movie so much. And she was absolutely terrific. And and she co-starred with, I forget her name, but it's Jonah Hill's sister. Uh plays her Amy Feldstein. Is that her name? Yeah, I think so. So the two of them play off each other so great. I would love to see a sequel, to be honest. I don't think they'll ever do one. And she has gone on to be continuously great in all the other stuff she's been in. Yeah, she'd have to she don't have to bulk her up to the point that she looks like an Olympic gymnast like Abby looks like in the game. But you would probably want to build, buck her up a little bit. But listen, to me, the number one thing always in any casting is, are you getting a really talented actor? She's it. So if they do go with her, wonderful. If they go with someone else, that's perfectly good too. But I would be very happy to hear it if she actually ends up getting the role. All right, what's next? All right. Matt Cicillo says, regarding the He-Man film, do you think they will cast one actor to play both Prince Adam and He-Man, or will they do a Shazam and cast two different actors? I have, you know what, that's a very good question. Because like I said on the show yesterday, even as a kid, Rob, watching He-Man, I would always think, how can they not tell that Prince Adam is He-Man? <laughs> he literally looks exactly the same. He's shirtless. He's wearing a long sleeve shirt as Prince Adam, sure. But even when Prince Adam is wearing the long sleeve shirt, he's fucking jacked. <laughs> like you can just tell he's stupid jacked. Yeah. And he has the same dumb bowl haircut. And how can you not tell? I think they're going with one actor. Yeah, I would love to see one actor. <laughs> Jonathan brought it up right there. Oh, wait. He-Man's hair is a little bit more oh, orange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he's a little bit more tanned. It's more tanned. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I would love to see one actor. Maybe do like, it'll be expensive, but do the first Captain America movie where uh, Chris Evans is scrawny. Yeah. Something like that, but it'll be a very expensive to do that. But yeah, for a full film, maybe I would pretty... <laughs> love to see the same actor do it. Yeah. Prince Adam with his protein yeah, it's like shake. Buff for the shirt, man. We like, took... look how Jack Prince Adam. Looks. I know what. Just what's drinking it? his little drink. Is his head not even a, his head? Is that just a muscle on top? No, oh. I granted, granted, it's not all that far removed from how did people not know Clark Kent was Superman? I get it, but at least he had glasses. Here, he's like skinny and looks a little different. Yeah, in that yeah. animated iteration, they do it a little bit differently. But I mean, yeah. in the original cartoon, like that image that Jonathan had, that yeah. original cartoon. If you put Brock Lesnar in a pink shirt, he's still going to be Brock Lesnar. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's all I, can think, I, that's all I can think of when I see a body like <laughs> Brock Lesnar. All right. Let's take time for a couple more. What's All right. next? All right. Uh, Fett's hand says, what does it take to make it a story versus an event that is happening? What do you mean? No, no, no. no, no, no. Look, don't confuse story with event. Uh, when we talk about, like sometimes we mention here on the show that, you know, Marvel films coming out used to be events. We're not saying that in replacement of a story. No, no, no. All movies are stories. That's a totally, totally, totally separate thing. When we talk about something becoming an event, it, it's like one of those things where, like when the new, when a, a new Star Wars movie came out for the first time in a decade or two decades, right? Or, or the next Batman movie is coming. Like it's something that more than just hardcore movie fans, people see coming and it's like becomes something that gets circled on a calendar. Like it, it's become something bigger than just another movie's opening day. And with the Marvel films, it used to be that every time a new Marvel movie was coming out, man, it was like a movie would come out and then it was like, okay, now it's a four month countdown till the next Marvel film comes out and everybody's counting down. And that's where all the focus was. It was more than just a movie. It was an event. And there've been many others, like when a Harry Potter would come a new Harry Potter movie would come out. That would be an event. I mean, the real Harry Potter, not the Fantastic Beast stuff. Um, and that's what it's lost. It's not about story versus event. It's about stories are all movies, but events are when a movie becomes something more than just a movie to a lot of people. And it's not about even it being a good movie. It's about something that everybody seems to be counting down to. And that's just not Marvel anymore. Till Deadpool 3. Because <laughs> that's an event. All right, what's next? Uh, Temple DC, John and crew, with all the pieces moving at Marvel and everything going on and the things that had happened, is there any chance that Feige uh, may have lost the passion he once had? He has been doing the same thing for so many years that he might need to move on to something fresh, new challenges. I've been saying that for four or five years, but not because he's lost his passion. I've been saying for four or five years, and people just always looked at me like I was crazy. They said, look, at some point, 
What have you got left to prove? When you have made literally the most successful film franchise in the history of cinema, what do you got left to prove? That there's nothing left to do. Take on a new... And you, when you get creative people like Kevin Feige, they're going to be looking for the next mountain to climb. And I, I do think that soon he'll probably depart. But I don't think that's... Like, with the state of Marvel, everybody conveniently forgets that... Rob, you and I talked about this over three years ago. When Bob Chapek... Not when he first took over, because I was all for him being the successor to Bob Iger at first. But when not long after that, Bob Chapek announced the new power structure at Disney. And he stripped Kevin Feige and the other studio heads of tons of their authority, created three new layers of middle management that was run by bankers, and gave the bankers the authority to determine how many projects get made, which projects get made, and where do the, most importantly, where do those projects go? Do they go theatrical? Do they go streaming? Do they go straight to home video? Whatever. And all that was authority that Kevin Feige used to have. So Bob Iger had already introduced the notion of Disney Plus. We we're going to put some Marvel stuff on there. They had already got the ball rolling. But then once Bob Chapek came in, stripped away Kevin Feige's authority, mandated a glut of new content, um, and all this kind of stuff. And we said, Rob and I said over three years ago, guys, you're not going to feel this immediately, but in a couple of years, we're going to feel the negative effects of this. And here we are today. We're, and we're, by the way, we're still going to be feeling the negative effects for the next year or two. We just are. That's, that's how much longer we've got to live in this. So I, I don't think it has anything to do with Kevin Feige losing his passion but I have said for a number of years now that as a creative dude, he's going to look for his next challenge. And it's not going to be a lateral move. I, I used to think maybe he'll take over Star Wars, but that's just a lateral move for him. It's, it's going to be going on to another studio to take over a role that likened unto what uh, Alan Horn had or something like that. But I don't know, Rob, what do, you, what do you think about that right now? Well, I mean, look, he has been doing it for a long time, but I think that the entire industry, the entire entertainment business has been taken over by this Wall Street thinking that doesn't work in this particular business. And I think, you know, like you said, adding layers of bankers to make creative decisions that they're not capable or under, of under even understanding has really hurt the business across the board. And that's why we're seeing Paramount might be getting sold, you know, Disney's stock price is down. Everybody's having these problems. Kevin Feige has already, the guy could go away to a desert island, we could never hear him again, and he'd still be the most successful producer that ever existed in Hollywood. I think Kevin Feige really wants to get back to making, he, making great movies. I think that's what he's wanted to do. And all of this this behemoth franchise that he built, this gigantic monster of, of, of money-making is something that is great. But the core values of that, what made that so great, was going back, look at Iron Man 1, a personal story about a man coming to grips with his own conscience. And, and forget them, take the Marvel out of it. It was a great actor in Robert Downey Jr., a ballsy choice to get behind him, and you made a movie that resonated, made half a billion dollars, and no one knew whether it would hit or not. I think that's what Kevin Feige wants to go back and do. His, the core mandate is make great fantasy cinema, and don't worry about the, 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 the franchise of it all. So right. I think we're going to see him. He's going to roar back and fix the Marvel Cinematic Universe first. He's going to go it's off. It's going to take then, time, though. It's, it's going to take, take a lot time. of time. Look, you've got, you're going to take a year off. We're going to get one movie. It's going to be uh, dead, dead Deadpool 3. It's the only Marvel film coming out in 2024. Only, and you know what? That movie's going to make a billion dollars. Yes, it will. And then Marvel will be back on top. They're going to sit there, and they're going to reboot. And then in 2025... By Avengers the way, when Rob Doomsday. says reboot, he means like creatively behind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not, not, re not, yes, not I don't mean yes. They're not going to reboot. They're they're going to fix their problems because that's what Kevin Feige is good at. Remember, he was the guy they didn't make the Inhumans movie. You know, he'll he'll reset, and you know what? Deadpool three or threesome, whatever it's called, is the perfect place to pause. Yep. Go put them on pause with a super high note which we all believe Deadpool 3 is going to be. Because if you... And then it, the next film coming out in 2025 is going to be an event. Because they can't claim Spider-Man 
No Way Home because that's Sony, but they still had a, a hand in it. You've got Guardians 3, you've got No Way Home, and you've got now Wolverine and Deadpool, Deadpool threesome. You've got those three movies, and those movies are still very successful, very creatively satisfying. Audiences loved them. And then after Deadpool 3, people are going to have so much fun, they're going to they're going to be like, okay, tell us what's next. And yeah. what's next, can it has a fresh, call it a fresh start. Yep, I 100% believe that's going to be part of the thinking there and we'll see if it works all right guys and that'll do it for today's installment of the john campy show podcast thank you so much for being here making the show part of your day big special thank you to all you guys who sent in questions number one because you gave us great fun things to talk about but number two you supported our channel whether you're channel members or use the super chat feature and all of us here at the show thank you guys so much for that support I want to thank the people in the room with me ray aura yeah 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 jonathan voico See ya. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. Madam Webb. And most oh, importantly, wow. thanks to you guys. My name's John Campion. Until next time, my friends, bye-bye.